coming up now on Animal Outtakes. Would you say that this is nature at its best? To me it is. This week on Animal Outtakes, we're witnessing the most miraculous life cycle of the butterfly. We know how the birds and the bees work, but for this species of fish, the females aren't the ones that get pregnant. Inspector Planet teaches us all about Mr. Mom. And keeping your pooch's feet on the ground, how to train your dog to not jump up on people is in tips and tricks. This and much more straight ahead on Animal Outtakes. They symbolize transformation, change, and hope. Butterflies are an amazing animal. How they develop is an example of how remarkable Mother Nature can be. We recently got a chance to visit a commercial butterfly breeder to learn more about a butterfly's life cycle. Butterflies, they're magical, they're romantic. Why did you get started in something like this? It was a hobby uh, to see what I could attract by using native plants and wanted to attract both hummingbirds and butterflies to my garden and it just got carried away. The plants and the butterflies are connected. The butterflies have a particular plant that they use to lay their eggs on and that's the only thing that their caterpillars will eat. And so for the ecosystem of our country, this is pretty good. Yes, they're a pollinator, you know, which pollinators are on the decline. And so helping the butterflies is something that I say we're helping them one release at a time. Is this? this is a giant milkweed. Okay. And these are monarch eggs. Now, for a lay person such as myself, yeah. I would be looking at this plant and say, hmm, Maybe something's wrong with this plant. It's got a lot of white speckles on it. Maybe it's not healthy, but that right. is the misnomer. That's a misnomer. And in nature, you wouldn't find this many eggs on one plant. You might find one. I see. But when this is the only thing that 10 or 12 females can lay on, they're gonna lay a lot of eggs. So that's what they've done on, on okay. this plant. All right, so here they are. They've laid the eggs. Right. Then the next step, what we do as a professional breeder we remove the eggs from the plant and they go through a solution of bleach and water. It's called an OE wash, which removes any pathogens and OE spores from the eggshell and any virus particles so that we have clean eggs that healthy caterpillars will hatch from and their first meal is that eggshell. So we want to make sure there's nothing on the eggshell. This is the Monarch Lab where we have Monarch caterpillars. Here's some nice healthy caterpillars. Let me set them up and we'll take a look at them. They're eating machines. They double in size every day. But oh my goodness. Look at that. Now you've got a lot of food in here. Yeah. They're not going to really get through this, are they? They'll have that eaten by tomorrow morning. Really? Yeah. All of this? Pretty much. I mean, there's yeah. more greenery in here than a human gets for a salad. Right, right. It takes 18 days from the day that the egg was laid until the caterpillar will be forming a chrysalis. So it just, and three days before the egg hatches. So there's really only 15 days that the caterpillars are actually eating. Well, they're moving fast at they this, aren't they? They move real fast. They double in size every day. Oh my goodness. Right, oh right. my goodness. And so do their appetites. So they just, they're eating machines, literally. So in each one of these containers that we see here, which are dated, right. and you're following these very, very uh, diligently, um, how many are in each of these cases? Generally 25. Okay. In a cage. And at this time of year, we don't produce as much as what we do in season. In season, the lab would be full of cages. 
with 25 cats in a cage. And what do you consider in season? Any time for us from uh, April through the end of October. We just came from the Monarch Lab. This is what's being formed in there is a Monarch Chrysalis. We have other species here, such as Malachites. And oh Zima my goodness. Wings. Look at the beautiful colors already. Which these are monarchs that are reclosing. So it changes from that beautiful green to the actual colors of the butterfly. So you can see him in there and he's just about ready to open up. This is just totally amazing. You know, these beautiful creatures, unfortunately we've learned that the most beauty that nature has lives a very, very short life. What is the life expectancy here? Well, the average expectancy is about two weeks for most butterflies, but they live a little longer when it's cooler. And we also have some species that we raise, the zebra longwing, that lives up to six months because they eat pollen instead of just nectar. So we have to enjoy these quickly. Quickly, right. Connie, you have taken us through the most wonderful, miraculous adventure I think we've been on. And just to be able to hold this beautiful creature just kind of gets you, doesn't it? Yes, it does. And we were so pleased to be here to watch this miracle of the chrysalis into this magnificent creature. Thank you for what you do. Flutterby Garden ships butterflies for events like weddings, parties, and even funerals. The butterflies are packed in a special envelope. And since these insects are cold-blooded, they are put in a box with ice packs to slow their movement. None of this hurts the butterflies. Once they arrive at their destination, they can quickly warm up and be let go. Here's a fun fact. Have you heard touching a butterfly can harm them? Well, that's actually an old wives' tale. Connie says butterflies are actually quite rugged. So, we're breaking stereotypes. We are female scientists, and these seahorses are breaking stereotypes too. There is no stereotype to science or the ocean, as it turns out. dog deserves a lifelong loving home. Dante's Den provides a pristine, comfortable haven for dogs that have been abandoned or surrendered by their owners. We ensure that every pup in our Joyful Dogs Adoption Program receives lots of love and attention, is properly immunized, spayed or neutered, and is in good health. Prospective pet parents undergo a thorough adoption review to ensure a lifetime of love and care. Find your new furry best friend at Dante's Den. For more information, go to dantesden.org or call 844-DANTES-DEN. Dante's Den, continuing the love. everywhere and it's all around us. It's observing the world, forming questions, and the willingness to find the answers. It's something our Inspector Planet does every day, and you can too. Hi, my name is Dr. Tracy Fanara. I'm an environmental engineer, which means that I use different scientific disciplines to protect the environment, humans, and wildlife. At Moat Marine Laboratory, I answer questions with investigation and myth-busting. Oh, look, Dr. Tracy, uh, you got something wrong. Um, 
The male? No, 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 no. <laughs> Wrong. Female? Hmm. I think we need to change it. So this is actually the coolest thing about seahorses. They break gender roles. The male actually is the one that gets pregnant and has the babies. Oh, come on. I'm, I'm not kidding. <laughs> this could start a whole new trend. <laughs> oh, well, we wish, don't we? <laughs> Seahorses are a type of bony fish and they look really, really differently from other fish because they don't have your traditional scales and stuff like that. So they actually have these bony rings and then they have skin stretched over them. So they have a very solid structure. And some of the other unique things about them is that they have a snout and that's actually how they eat. So the snout works as like a vacuum and so they suck up their food really, really fast and it actually makes a noise. It's called a snick, and it's just a very light popping noise, and that's actually two bones in their head hitting together as they do it. They also have these tails, these prehensile tails, and they're very reminiscent of like a monkey tail. They're very strong, and they use that to anchor themselves on their surroundings. So male seahorses actually are the ones that carry the babies? Yeah, it's really incredible. Um, they actually get the eggs from the female seahorse, and then they are deposited into his pouch, and then he holds on to them for a couple of weeks, and they'll develop, and just after a few weeks, they'll become tiny, fully formed seahorses. Seahorses belong to a family called Cygnathids, and all of the Cygnathids, which include pipefish, pipe horses, sea dragons, um, all of the Cygnathids as a whole they do this sort of male pregnancy and they're the only family or the only group that shows this in the ocean. The female develops the eggs and then they do this elaborate courtship dance and it can go on for hours. And there's a lot of like follow the leader and you know swimming up into the water column together and at the very end of that dance, the female positions herself a little bit above the male um, so the base of her abdomen lines up perfectly with the opening to the male's pouch. And so what she has is an ovipositor. So during that dance, the ovipositor will come out and she will use the ov ovipositor to deposit those eggs into his pouch through the opening. That's so interesting. So is this like a kangaroo pouch? Is it on the outside or is it actually on the inside? Yeah, that's a great question. So it's, I, I think of it very similarly to a kangaroo pouch as well um, because it is actually somewhat external. So it's part of him um, and it's specifically designed to hold these babies, but it is not an internal part of his body. So the, so the eggs kind of sit in this specially designed pouch on the outside of his body, but he's able to osmoregulate it so he can send oxygen in and clean water and just make sure that those eggs have everything that they need. Why the male? Why are the gender roles switched in this species? Well, I mean, one reason why that is is the fact that if a male carries his babies, then he can ensure that those are his babies, his genetics are being protected by him, and he is able to make sure that his offspring have the best chance. So what you're telling me, Dr. Tracy, is that big pouch that is a male and he is pregnant. Yes, and he's got about 200 babies in that pouch. Oh my goodness, well, then we should have many seahorses around. You would think so, but when they're born, they're born really small so that they can travel far distances within the water column. Unfortunately, that makes them easy prey. So only about one out of every thousand seahorse babies makes it to adulthood. Well, it's not such a great deal for him, is it? Not so much, yeah. and actually the male is pregnant throughout its entire life. So if you think about it, they have to be pregnant five times in order to see one of their babies get to adulthood. Not a great job. Not a great job <laughs> at all. So remember guys, anyone could be a scientist or an engineer with some passion, hard work, and innate curiosity of how the world works. Talk about blending into their surroundings. Seahorses can be masters of camouflage. Just take a look at some of these seahorses. Can you spot them? It can be one of the worst habits to break, but our trainer has the tips and tricks to keep your dog down. That's coming up next.
There is nothing like coming home, opening your door, and having a 90-pound dog like Zeus here jump on you. That's not the kind of greeting you would want, and you certainly wouldn't want that introduction to a guest coming to visit. That's just not proper doggy etiquette. So how do you make your dog stay down? Our dog trainer, Paul Fern, shows us the skills. Paul, we have Kylo here, and Kylo is just showing bad behavior lately. <laughs> uh, hi, baby. Just jumps all over everybody. Uh, uh, like uh, this, sit, like sit, this. Sit. And because he's so happy, sit. He has his mouth open and then people get scared and they think, oh my gosh, she's gonna bite me. But no, he's just jumping. He's just happy. Yeah, well, he's happy, but he's not behaving <laughs> right. So, what do we do with him? <laughs> uh, jumping is, is a, uh, he's, he's happy, he's excited. Um, and you're, if, if like, now he's gonna jump. Uh, <laughs> to, to combat the, the jumping part, um, it's hard to say this, but when you come home, and they usually when you come home and there's the first person through the door they want to jump because they're oh, all yes. excited so it sounds mean but the best thing you need to do is just ignore them turn around turn your back to the dog go to the sink do whatever do something to ignore the dog to get him out of that that frenziness and then once he calms down turn around and tell him to sit down and keep trying to work on a sit trying to have him sit instead of jumping come through the door tell him to sit um, 80% of the people that I go to that the have the problem with the jumping are females because of the fluctuation in their voice. Uh, oh, baby, baby, how are you, how are you? And they, <laughs> instantly the dog wants to jump. The man comes home and it's like, hey, how are you, sit down. So the dogs kind of are already, there you go. Uh, the, <laughs> yeah. It's the female, just the fluctuation in the voices uh, and the, the tone difference that gets the dog um, out of that out of that frenziness. So change your, change your behavior turn around ignore the dog um, the old old school was to put your knee up you can actually I mean you could hurt a dog chip a tooth or something if you accidentally you know I'm not to not to thrust your knee into the dog but they, they used to say that to put a block you know between you and the dog mm -hmm. um, now at certain times of the year of course Paul we've got holidays and you have more of an influx of people into your home into your area uh, than normal how do you control that jumping with a group of people? Because you know they're going to run up and try yeah. to jump on everybody. I would, I would hope you would have that, you know, <laughs> work on that before they come over. Uh, the jumping part, um, work on the dog with, you know, several times a day to get him to just to break him of that, of that habit. And it's just because he's excited, and he's so happy, and oh, he's in that. You got to snap that out of his mind. Turn around, do something different, ignore him, and then stop. Nine, shush, shush, shush. <laughs> Just and you notice one other thing, and we've talked about this so many times, Paul, is the collar. Uh, we all like to dress up our dogs and make them look beautiful, <laughs> uh, especially around any holiday season that you might have. But the collar that we have, uh, which again is not a choke collar, you notice how well behaved, how he gets the commands just out of your yeah. hand and into that collar. Yeah, when they're used to the, the collar, um it, it, it doesn't it doesn't harm the dog at all the dog understands when it when it's too tight it, it stops the behavior that it's doing and it releases on its own it doesn't harm anything um, like any like any collar or any tool any piece of equipment if the person that is in control of that equipment wants to hurt somebody they can it's the same thing with this I mean it, with any collar with any leash uh, the dog knows when there's enough pressure on it to let go he you know he knows what to do and it, it corrects his behavior so I guess Kylo is ready for any holiday or any weekend play yeah. with just about anybody. Yep, he's a good boy. Like always, proper doggy behavior is a must for the safety of you and your pet. Paul says consistent training and repetition of skills can benefit any dog of any age. So keep it up.
Dr. Greiner, we've heard so much about stem cell, certainly for the humans, and now we know that you are playing a role in the animals. How can this really help these guys? Uh, well, first of all, a little bit about what stem cells are and the different types of stem cells. Uh, a stem cell is a very immature cell that as it reproduces can differentiate into other types of cells. Uh, so for instance, when you are, an egg is first fertilized by sperm, you've got one cell, and yet that's going to turn into trillions of cells throughout our body of all different cell types. And so embryonic stem cells are those that are taken from the very earliest stages of the cells dividing. And so there's been a lot of discussion about whether those can treat a, just a myriad of diseases. The problem with using embryonic stem cells is that A, when you harvest them, uh, by definition, you are killing the embryo, and uh, so that's not very ethical. Secondly, when you put them into a recipient, they're foreign cells, so you have a higher risk of rejecting them. But also, they are designed to grow an entire organism, and so they tend to form tumors very commonly. Ooh. And so for our discussion, we will not even consider embryonic stem cells. We use adult stem cells only. Uh, which in the case of dogs is uh, pretty well established now uh, that they are very beneficial for arthritis. And so when we harvest stem cells, uh, we can find them in fat. Actually, you can find them in almost every tissue in the body. When I was in school, I'm gonna date myself a little bit, but back in the 80s, uh, we were taught that once you're an adult, you no longer have stem cells in your body. Uh, that never made sense to me because then how do you heal a wound? Uh, we know now that the cells that support the blood vessels throughout your body are called pericytes. Peri means around, the cells around the blood vessels. Those are actually stem cells. And the reason that we like to harvest them from fat is they're very easy to separate. When you break up the fat and spin it in the centrifuge, the fat cells float, the other cells sink, and about half of those cells are actually stem cells. So they're very easy to harvest. Uh, and then when we inject them into a joint, we have found that the question was, why do stem cells know how to heal and start initiating a healing process? We know now that a lot of those chemical signals come from platelets. So if you're injured, you form a blood clot, platelets release the chemicals, they start healing. So now we also know that if you take a blood sample, separate the platelets, and give that with the stem cells, it activates them and really gets them going to heal. Now, is there any danger with doing this type of therapy? And do you take the cells from the dog that needs it, or are they coming foreign? It is always preferable to get your own cells because you're very unlikely to have a reaction to them. Uh, allogeneic stem cells are kind of the holy grail right now of the drug companies. Those would be cells that you can take from a universal donor and have them on the shelf ready to administer. You don't have to harvest them first. Uh, but the potential problem with that is that you are getting cells from a stranger. And if you have a reaction, it can be very severe. And uh, so I think it's a little bit early yet to be recommending those. Uh, they're not quite on the market, but they're very close. So Joey has a little bit of arthritis in, in these cute little legs. And of course, Zeus, who is my co-host, could possibly have hip dysplasia, which involves a lot of dogs, would you recommend stem cell for them if they need it? If it's one or two joints, because you have to treat each joint individually, uh, it would be ideal. If it's a more generalized arthritis, uh, currently we would recommend sticking with more traditional medications. Okay, you're gonna be well. We hope you had fun and learned a thing or two along the way. Zeus and I will be back here again next week with even more animals and some wild adventures. Until then, thanks for watching. Now open no, up. Jump. Perfect. <laughs> Turn to the side. Oh, wow. <laughs> they love the hair. No, they love the hairspray. <laughs> Perfect. It's much more pleasant to you than that cockatoo was. Because what you're going to do is you're going to put peanut butter all over you. They always get my hair. <laughs> There's nothing like coming home, opening your door, and having a 60-pound dog like Zeus. Are you kidding me? I didn't know this meant to ask. What's your going rate now? 90. He's okay. 90. Okay.
go from a little, little cocoon to this magnificent butterfly. And they're not cocoons. What is it? <laughs> it's a chrysalis. <laughs> it's a chrysalis. <laughs> Hi, it's close. It's like, oh, okay. I don't know. I impressed you, didn't I? <laughs> okay. All right.